A quick story, this is obviously, this building used to be a church. Um, in 2018, the church body uh, merged with Union Grove United Methodist Church, and the preacher there, his name is Rich Greenway. Um, he would, he's a great guy. <clears throat> this, this place was his vision. Um, he would be here tonight, but he's at a wedding rehearsal dinner. But um, he decided that rather than this building uh, just sitting empty and going to waste, he wanted to turn it into a bit of like a community center. So he did that, and throughout the week here, you'll see things like uh, writer's night. Uh, there's a chess club that meets here. There's yoga classes on the weekends, um, all sorts of cool stuff. There's a literacy camp uh, that they hold every summer. Um, uh, if he were here, he could tell you much more. There's a free meal every Tuesday. There's a, a kitchen next door. No strings attached, you just show up and hang out with your, your neighbors, meet some cool people. And then he also wanted to introduce music, include music. Um, I'm a musician and I used to own a club in Hillsboro uh, a long time ago, downtown. So uh, Rich is a great guy and I told him I would help out. So we started this about a year and a half ago. We have local acts, we have national acts. We've had all sorts of great shows through here. Uh, bluegrass, jazz, a couple of what I would call rock shows, and we've got a whole bunch more coming. We've got Joe Newberry coming in September, which is a big deal. So. But anyway, so a while back, Larry approached me, told me the cool, cool story of how he put all this together. Um, obviously, uh, at the center of that was Amos. I knew Amos, and um, we have a, a Sunday night jam at my house. We play guitars by the fire, and we drink beer and tell stories, and Amos was a part of that on a couple of occasions. So when Larry approached me, uh, about what they had in mind. I said, of course we can do this, let's put this together. And another really cool bonus story, while we were standing at the door tonight, we have a, a couple of new friends here who knew Steve 50 years ago. They were only five years old. Yeah, they were only five years old. <laughs> but they said they spotted the ad in the paper and immediately bought tickets and uh, came out. I think that deserves a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell all your friends about the Eno House. We're really just getting started. It's a cool place. Early shows, clean shows. Um, you know, I'm sorry, clean bathrooms. I don't like the shows. <laughs> but spread the word for sure. You can tune in to us at enohouse.org, and there's a whole schedule of everything going on. So I'm gonna be quiet and get out of the way. Everybody, please clap your hands for Mr. Steve Corner. Yeah. Can you hear me? So I'm I'm driving in yesterday and I'm on uh, Interstate 40 and I admit I probably was exceeding the limit maybe I don't know I got pulled over by North Carolina Highway Patrolman handsome guy well dressed well spoken and he comes up to the car and he taps on the window. I roll the window down, he said, sir, can I please see your driver's license? And I looked at him, I says, I don't have one. I furrowed his brow a tad, and he said, well, can I please see the vehicle registration? I says, I don't have any vehicle registration. And that further furrowed his brow, and he says, don't you go anywhere. He's the sternest look that he possibly could muster. And he goes up to his patrol car and he gets on the radio and faster than I have ever seen before, another North Carolina patrolman shows up. This guy's a sergeant. And they confer. Now confer is a cowboy term that means two people of reasonable importance talking out of earshot so you don't know what the hell they're saying. That's conferring. <laughs> now the sergeant comes back, taps on my window. I rolled my window down. He said, sir, can I please see your driver's license? And I said, sure. <laughs> I reached in my wallet, took my driver's license out, handed it to him. That furrowed his brow a tad, and he said, well, can I please see your vehicle registration? He says, why, of course. And I reached in a glove compartment, took the vehicle registration out, and ceremoniously handed it to him. Now he's got this thoroughly confused look on his face, and he said, sir, 
the patrolman said you didn't have a driver's license, and he also said you didn't have any vehicle registration. And I said to the sergeant, I said, I suppose he also told you I was speeding. <laughs> How about that? Is that okay? so gently laid him on his bed and opening wide his blue eyes and looking all around motioned to his comrades sit near him on the ground I want you to send my mother my wages the wages I have earned for I'm afraid boys my last year I have turned I'm going to a new land and I hear my master's call and I'll not see my mother the work's all done this fall Pete, you can have my pistol Jake, you can take my bed but you can have my saddle after I'm dead Think upon me kindly as you gaze upon the ball. 
Give my love to mother. The work's all done this fall. When Charlie died that morning, with no tombstone at his head, nothing but a little board, and this is what it read. Charlie died this morning. He died from a fall. He'll not see his mother. The work's all done this fall. son of a gun for this. I don't generally practice because I can't stand it. I hate practicing. But, you know, when, you, when you're my age, God, I can't believe I said that. You have to. Well, okay. Um, this next song, by the way, that the one I just did is from the 1890s. By the way. D.J. O'Malley, the guy that wrote it, always said it was a true story. And he maintained that until the 1930s when he, when he passed on. So, Well, this next one is a similar era. And it's about a craze that swept across the United States and Europe as well in the late 19th century, and the craze was called bicycle riding. <laughs> Up until 1887, when the safety bicycle was patented, safety, the bicycles looked odd. You know, the Columbia bicycle, which was a popular model prior to the invention of the safety bicycle, had a front wheel that was five feet tall. The rear wheel was 18 inches. You had to be fundamentally crazy and a serious athlete just to ride the doggone thing. Then along comes the safety bicycle, which is the same front and rear wheel with a chain and stuff. And people everywhere wanted to ride one. I mean, they started having races in wooden tracks called velodromes. And they even, in the 1890s, set a world's record that lasted for decades and decades of 94 miles an hour. Now, you're probably wondering, how the heck do you get a bicycle going 94 miles an hour? Well, here's how you do it. You get an abandoned stretch of track, seven, eight miles long, and you build a bicycle track in between the rails. Then you get a bicycle and you have one gear the size of the rear wheel, a huge gear. Then you get somebody who's completely idiotic <laughs> to ride it. Then you build a fairing, a windbreak on the back of a locomotive. You get him adrift here. Then you put that guy on the bicycle, in the fairing, and off you go. And he, said, he later said he lived. He later said, well, we got to 60 and I started to fall back and then they got scared because, you know, the turbulence just a little ways in back of that ferry would have knocked him off the track. So they said his legs became a blur and he made it over 90 miles an hour. And of course, then they just picked him up and the bicycle itself was destroyed. Now, what's the value of this? Why are you here tonight listening to this? It could be that you could be walking down the streets of Raleigh quite possibly, and some radio disc jockey walks up to you and says, hey, for $1,000, what's the world record on a flat track for a bicycle? And you'll know. You'll win the thousand bucks. 
I want 10%. See me afterwards. Cowboys weren't immune to trying to ride a bicycle. That's what this is about. I stole this off of my mentor, Glenn Orland. I can ride the wildest bronco in the wild and woolly west. I can rake him, I can break him, let him do his level best. I can handle any cattle for war, a coat of hair, and I had a lively tussle by the eternal grizzly bear. Rope and tie a long horn of the wildest Texas brand, and Indian disagreements I can take a leading hand. But I finally met my master. Really made me squeal when the boys got me a straddle of that girl turn wheel. Was a tenderfoot who brought it. As he was on his way from this land of freedom out to San Francisco Bay. Tied it at the ranch house outside to get a meal, never dreaming that his cowboys monkey with his wheel. There was Arizona. There was Jack McGill. They said I'd been bragging way too much about the skill. They said I'd find myself against a different kind of deed if I would get a straddle of that gold dirt wheel. <laughs> well, such a slam against my talent made me madder than a mink, and I swore that I would ride it for amusement or for cheek. That it was just a plaything for the kids in such a bout. They'd have their eyes shattered if they'd leave the critter out. They held it while I mounted and I gave the word to go. The push they gave to start me weren't unreasonably slow. But I never felt a cuss word, no, I'd never give a squeal. I was building reputation on that gall darn wheel. Now the grade was mighty sloping from the ranch down to the creek as I went galley flutin' like a crazy light in the street, just whizzing, darting first this way and then that. The dark contrivance wobbling like the flying of a bat. I pulled up on the handles, but I couldn't check it up. I jerked and egg and hollered, but the damn thing would not stop. Then a sort of mission in my brain began to steal. The devil had a mortgage called Darn Weir. Now I have a sort of dim and hazy remembrance of the stop with the world spinning around and the stars all tangled up and came an intermission. It lasted till I found that I was in the bunkhouse with the boys all gathered around. The doctor was sewing on the skin where it was ripped old. Arizona whispered, well, oh boy, I guess you win. I said I am busted from sombrero down the heel. He grinned and said, you ought to see that cop turn wheel. singing? Yeah. Okay, we're going to start off with something basic here. This is a song um, just before, well actually during COVID for some reason, I did a series of concerts in um, the Santa Fe Trail towns, they were called Boise City, Oklahoma, Clayton, New Mexico, and Elkhart, Kansas, all of which are on the the old Santa Fe Trail. Now, I'm a geek. I have stood in the ruts of the Santa Fe Trail, 200, over 200 year old ruts, and it was a thrill. I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys think that that's probably crazy, but you know, anyway. So here's your part in the song. Yo ho! <laughs> Try it. Yo ho! Okay, and then you repeat the previous line. Okay. 
So, yo ho. It's yo ho, and then you and you sing the previous line, which will be different each verse because I'm clever. <laughs> Say, pard, have you sighted a schooner? Alongside of the Santa Fe train. It may get here Monday or sooner. With a water keg tied to the tail. And there's Mammy and Pap on the mule seat. And somewhere alongside the train. There's a tow headed gal on a pinto. Just gangling for old Santa Fe. Yo ho! Gangling through old Santa Fe. See, you've got it, you've got it. I don't know her name on the prairie. Well, when you're hunting one gal, it's unwise. And it's shorter from hell to Larry than it is on the Santa Fe line. Hope to reach Plumber by sundown and make a good camp in the swale and come on to a gal on the pinto just gangling for old Santa Fe. Yo -ho! Saw her ride down the arroyo, way out on the Arkansas sand. And her eyes, her smile was like an acre of sun's flowers, with a little brown quirt in her hand. She mounted her pony so airy, and rode like she carried the mail. And her eyes now set fire to the prairie What a light Alongside of the Santa Fe Trail Yo-ho! Alongside of the Santa Fe Trail Now I know a gal down by the border That I ride to El Paso to sight I'm acquainted with a high flying order. And I sometimes kiss some gals goodnight. But law, they're all fruffles and beaten. And afternoon tea by the pail. Compared to the kind of Sam Sweet. I got on the Santa Fe Trail. Yo ho! I got on the Santa Fe Trail. You know, a um, couple of days ago, actually, a couple of days before I. Uh, came here, a knock on my door, and I go to the door, and there's a Jehovah Witnesses, and I invited him in, and so we sat on the couch, and I said to him, I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And he said, we don't know, we've never gotten this far before. <laughs> Folk singer walks out of a bar. Hey, it could happen. <laughs> what do you give me for that, Ralph? That's a 10. Oh, I give you a 10. <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, that's my old friend Ralph Besser. Oh. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> 
This is a metaphysical cowboy song. I don't really sing much about the alleged beauty of the West. Because I mean, it's there, certainly. And I've talked about this with people. You know, uh, being on a hill and at sunup, 5.30 in the morning after eating a pile of pancakes and it's quite pretty, but then the reality sets in and you've got cattle to move around and things like that. So that's about as far as the metaphysical goes. This song you've heard before. Um, and in the Old West, when a criminal was executed or died or did something, they quite often would display his body in front of the coroner's, the doctor's office or the sheriff's office in a coffin. So everybody could see that this was what you got if you didn't obey the law, you know. You've probably seen photographs of that. Well, that's kind of the setting for this song. And, and what we have here, the protagonist, how about that for a sophisticated <laughs> reference? Protagonist. It's about a 17-year-old kid. He's just off the trail. The cowboys that went up the, the, you know, the trail were all were quite young. They really were. Say so he's 17 years old. He's just been paid, and he's full of himself. And he's walking down the street in Laredo, Texas, and he sees this coffin with a body in it. And he starts to walk by it, and all of a sudden the body starts talking to him, to warn him. Beside me, my knife is six years. Spurs at my heels and my rifle by my side. And on top of my coffin, put a bottle of brandy. The cowboys might drink as I take my last ride. Beat the drum slowly, play the fife lowly, play the dead march. Bear up my paw, and on top of my coffin, put bunches of roses. Roses to dead, with the clods as they fall.
As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy all dressed in white linen, dressed in white linen, as cold as the clay. Cowboy Mentor was a guy named Art Miller, and Art used to come around, watch me ride colts, you know, and he had the, the spiffiest, that's just the way to refer to it, the spiffiest truck I ever saw. It was a 1958 Chevy 4x4, short bed step side, indestructible, completely indestructible. I didn't have a, a dome light, so he'd just open the door and he'd leave it and it would never run out. I remember uh, I found a spur body in the barn one day and Art showed up again and watched me ride Colts and he said, I said, Art, did you lose a spur when you worked on this place? Because he'd been on it like 40 years before. I said, yeah, I did. And I showed him. He says, that's it. He said, keep it. It still is on my mantle. You know. Anyway, one of the things he used to say to me, he'd say, now, Steve, don't be afraid to take the bull by the horns. And then when no one was listening, he would whisper to me, he'd say, just make sure it's a really tiny bull. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... Uh, this is a song about comeuppance, more or less. Uh, so the, the scene is, is the cowboys are waiting to get fed from the chuck wagon. And they're sitting around smoking tobacco or whatever the hell it is. And into camp walks this stranger. He just They have no idea who he is or where he's from or anything. And he comes in there and they give him some food, and he wants to borrow a horse. Well, they look at him, and they think, there's no way this guy can handle anything. He's a city slicker, he's a greenhorn. And there were three reasons why they thought that. One is that uh, he was wearing Brogan business shoes. And I used to reference this by asking some businessman in the audience to sh lift his foot up, but none of you wear Brogan business shoes anymore. Never mind. Anyway, he's wearing them. He, he's also got a three-piece suit. Wearing a three-piece suit. And what really settles the issue is he's speaking in complete sentences. <laughs> and he addresses them. He says, excuse me, sons of the soil, is it possible for chance to borrow the equine species, the purpose of which is to perambulate down semi-macadam road, yawn to perhaps gain employment at the next rancho? <laughs> City slicker. So the prankster of the group, a guy named Shorty, gets his lariat and goes to the Ramuda, the horse herd, and he ropes the worst one in the bunch, the zebra dun. And the dun has, is an awful horse, but he has one virtue. It's like some old campaign horses I used to try to ride when I rodeo. He will let you get on him. He will stand still and let you get on him. Then all hell breaks loose. That's, a, that's, his only, that's the only virtue. So. They know it, the, the stranger doesn't. We were camped upon the plains at the head of the Cimarron. When along come a stranger and he stopped to argue some. He looks very foolish, we began to look around. Thought he was a green horn just escaped from town. Now we asked if he had breakfast and he hadn't had a smear. So he opened up the chuck box and bid him take his share. Took a cup of coffee and some bacon and some beans. Then began to talk about them foreign kings and queens. Well, about the Spanish War and the fighting on the sea. 
Guns as big as steers and ramrods as big as trees and about Paul Jones a mean fighting son of a gun. About the orneriest cuss he ever pulled a gun. Now such an educated fella his thoughts just running herds and he astonished all the cowboys with them jaw-breaking words. He just kept on talking till he made the boys all sick. And we began to look around how to play a trick. Well, he said he lost his job upon the Santa Fe, and he's going across the plains just to strike the 7D. He didn't say how come he had some trouble with the boss, that he'd like to borrow a nice fat saddle hoss. Now this tickled all the boys to death. We laughed on in their sleeves. Oh, we'll give you a horse nice and fat as you please. Sure, he grabbed a lariat and roped the zebra done, handed it to the stranger. Just waiting for the fun, old Dunn was an outlaw who had grown so very wild. And he could paw the white out of the moon and jump for a mile, but he stood so very silent, as though he didn't know, till he was saddled and ready for her to go. When the stranger hit the saddle, old Dunn quit the earth, traveled right straight up for all he was worth pitching and squalling and howling while I fits nine feet perpendicular, the front was in the bits. Now you can see the tops of mountains under Dunn at every jump. But the strangers grow up there like a camel's hump. The stranger sat upon him and twirled his black mustache like a summer reporter just waiting for his hash when he thumped him in the shoulders. Spurred him when he whirled, just to show them flunky punchers, he's the wolf of the world. And when he had dismounted once more upon the ground, we know he was a thoroughbred and not a gent from town. Now the boss was standing around, taking in of the show. And he walked up to the stranger and he said, you needn't go. You can use a lariat like you rode the zebra done. You're the man. I've been looking for since the year of one. Now he could toss a lariat, and he didn't do it slow. Catch them hind feet, nine out of ten for any kind of dough. And when the herd stampeded, he was always on the spot. He set him to milling, just like the boiling of a pot. And it's one thing, it's a sure thing. I know since I've been born, every educated fella ain't a plum. Green Homer. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm going to do one more, and we'll take a uh, required break of about 15 minutes. And that'll give you time to go back and buy all my CDs so I don't have to take the damn things home. <laughs> now, let me, let, me, let me give you a spiel about these, these recordings that I've been making. The money doesn't go to me. The money goes into an education fund for my granny Cormier. She's 98. And she spent most of her adult life in prison. She's married seven times. Okay, so they all ended up dead. She got blamed and they put her in prison. All right. I admit it. Which is not really the problem, but here's the problem. She's out on parole and she's dating. Okay, so you educators, you teachers, professors know that it's just so much cheaper to educate someone than it is to put them in prison. So that's what... That's why you should buy my CDs. I figure that's pretty, that's pretty uh, clever. So this song is about a, a great bucking horse. And one of the things about rodeo is that they, we celebrate not only the, some of the riders, but also the animals as well. And, and this horse, Tipperary, was almost unrideable in South Dakota. And I found out about him because I played in, in uh, Buffalo, South Dakota, this little town which is in the northwest part of South Dakota near the southwest part of <laughs> North Dakota near the Montana border. Say that fast five times, I dare you. 
Anyway, the song was written by a guy named Tex Fletcher, who was from the Bronx. And during the 30s, Fletcher hit the, the rails, like uh, millions of others, and so after a while decides he wanted to be a cowboy, and he ended up in Buffalo, South Dakota, and they took him in. They taught him the skills, they taught him the, you know, the protocol and everything. And he knew about Tipperary, so he wrote this song. What apparently they said that what he really wanted to do was go to Hollywood and be a Hollywood cowboy. Because, I mean, he was a real cowboy. He had become one, but he wanted to go to Hollywood. So he did. He made one movie. They showed me the movie. And listen, I've been in some bum movies myself, so I know something about it. This is terrible. The final climactic scene consists of a brawl between cowboys and football players. <laughs> Don't ask why. I, I, I'm just not sure. So it's got a chorus. And I'll teach you just like I did the last time. Thumbs up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, and don't go anywhere because the the um, 
What what is the name of the uh, Posse Cormitatis? The Posse Cormitatis is going to <laughs> join me. Larry St Bellani and and uh, Jane and the others, and they're 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 like real musicians. You'll 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 like them, and they sing on key. 